Um, it's wonderful to see you all online. So we've had uh, several registrations from a couple of people, um, mostly from South Africa, but also people from Nigeria, Sudan, Kenya, and Mozambique. Uh, all of, to, some, to some of you who may be joining for the first time, uh, welcome. Uh, and uh, we hope you'll be able to join us going forward in the two year cycle. So as you all know, our meetings take place every fortnight on a Monday at 6 p.m. If you're interested in some of the surgical topics, they have their meetings, uh, their fellow teaching a meeting every Monday. Uh, I think it's from 4.30 or 5 p.m. Uh, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, Karen um, can share with you the links if you're interested in joining those uh, meetings as well. Um, GECO is hosted by the Gastro Foundation in, associated with, in association with the New Mexico University in Albuquerque. And um, it's really a platform uh, to share knowledge um, and to, to grow in the, in the speciality. So, and I think it's been very useful for us, especially uh, with COVID, but I think it has allowed us the opportunity to expand uh, our training and also just uh, to form as a network uh, of people uh, interested in gastroenterology. So today we're going to be talking about um, nutritional deficiencies, so pernicious anemia and iron deficiency anemia. It's going to be presented by Yonella. She will tell you a little bit about herself before she gets into the presentation. Um, as she presents, um, feel free to uh, put your questions in the, in the chat box. Uh, and also at the end though, you'll have opportunity to ask her questions. Uh, or to share your comments. So I'm gonna hand over to you, Yonela, uh, uh, take it away, and thanks. All right, thanks, Prof. Okay, can you see my screen, Prof? Uh, not yet, not yet, Yonela. Okay. Mm -hmm. And, and now you're muted as well, eh? probably by accident. Okay. Yeah, you're unmuted, that's great. There you are, it's coming up. Okay, I can see it. Um, so yeah, go ahead. All right. Okay, um, good evening, everyone. Um, thank you, Prof. Uh, my name is um, Yonela Kubekila. Um, uh, I'm based at um, Inkose Albert uh, Lutuli here in Durban, um, South Africa, uh, in GI. So I started um, GI in Feb, um, February this year. So this is essentially um, my fourth month uh, in GI. So I'll start my presentation. Um, today I'll be presenting pernicious anemia and iron deficiency anemia. So pernicious anemia is an autoimmune disease that affects the gastric uh, mucosa and results in gastric atrophy. Um, antibodies are produced against cells of the stomach or against an uh, intrinsic factor. This leads to destruction of the parietal cells and failure to produce intrinsic factor, resulting in vitamin B12 malabsorption and um, vitamin B12 deficiency. It's the most common cause of uh, cobalamin uh, deficiency anemia worldwide. Uh, pernicious, pernicious anemia is more common in temperate climate. It affects both sexes, uh, sexes equally. The age of presentation um, is approximately um, 60 years. The relationship between uh, pernicious anemia and uh, helicobacter pylori is still unclear, but there is a genetic um, link because pernicious anemia has a familial link with less than 19% having a family member with um, a pernicious anemia. And there's also the genotype uh, HLA um, DR uh, B1 and DR B1 uh, 0.4 uh, is associated with pernicious anemia and other autonomic um, uh, autoimmune diseases. So if we look at the absorption of uh, vitamin B12, so vitamin B12 is ingested as either non-protein um, bound or protein bound. So if it is a protein, uh, it's bound to protein um, to, 
then uh, it will uh, bind to a, if it's not a protein bound when you ingest it, it will bind to a carrier protein, which is known as the R bound binder. And this is secreted by both the salivary glands. Um, let me just get a pointer. So this is um, um, secreted by the salivary glands in the oropharynx or also in the gastric um, uh, mucosal cells. The B12 will remain bound with the R bounder until it reaches the uh, second uh, segment of the duodenum in the small intestines. So if it is admitted, if it is ingested um, um, not, uh, bound, then um, it undergoes um, cleavage in the stomach where it is, um, then it will bind to the R binder. The cleavage uh, depends uh, mostly on uh, functional activity of pepsin, um, which is pepsinogen is secreted by the chief cells in the stomach. And um, um, what happens is that the, pepsinogen, the, the pepsin cleaves the protein from the vitamin B12. Um, for pepsinogen, um, uh, it needs to be also converted to pepsin by uh, hydrochloric, um, hydrochloric uh, HCl, hydrochlorothic um, acid, and this is um, the HCl is um, secreted by the parietal cells. Then intrinsic factor we know is um, also secreted by the um, gastric parietal cells. So upon entry into the second segment of the duodenum, the um, uh, vitamin B12 is still bound to the R um, uh, factor, to the R binder. And um, what happens is that the pancreas re releases proteases. Uh, these split the um, um, B12 from the R binder. And then the B12 binds to uh, intrinsic factor for the remainder of the journey to the ileum for absorption. So if the ileum um, is uh, functionally intact, then the B12 to intrinsic factor is absorbed in the terminal ileum. And um, once it's absorbed, it's transported by uh, transco, balaman, uh, transco balamin 2, and 50, um, more than 50% of it goes to the liver and the, the other goes into different tissues. So this is also just a, a slide explaining the absorption from what I've just summarized, uh, absorption of uh, B12. So some of the causes, uh, what are some of the causes of um, 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 macrocytic anemia and causes of vitamin B12? If we look at the slide, um, um, some of the causes of uh, vitamin B12 um, deficiency are total or partial gastrectomy, gastric bypass, or either gastric bariatric surgery, ileal resection, um, uh, inflammatory bowel disease, tropical sprue, uh, mild atrophic gastritis, um, use of met metformin or drugs that block um, um, stomach acid. And some of the causes of microcytic anemia are hypoplastic anemia, malodysplastic syndromes, folate, liver disease, including alcohol, advanced cirrhosis, poor di um, diet, um, and other uh, drugs as noted on the slide. Uh, but some of the causes of a false, uh, that you need to note, uh, false um, 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 a falsely low vitamin B12, a folate. Um, if someone has a low folate, it can cause um, a falsely low vitamin B12. And also, um, if um, if a patient has gone um, um, has received um, um, has gone through, um, let's say they had a test, a nucleic uh, acid test, and they've re uh, received a bit of radiation, so that can also cause um, a, a low um, levels of vitamin B12. So when we look at chronic uh, gastritis, uh, chronic gastritis is a loss of gastric mucosal folds and thinning um, of the gastric mucosa. It's divided into type A and type B. So type A is autoimmune and type B is non-autoimmune. So in the type A, the antrum um, is sped with, um, and there's also anti positive antibodies to parietal cells and intrinsic factor, um, and also um, low serum pepsinogen uh, concentration. And um, uh, this leads to vitamin B12 deficient um, uh, state, megaloblastosis. But with type B, it's as uh, antrum is involved, the antrum, the body, and the corpus is all, they all involved. And this is associated with the helicobacter pylori infection. So this is a slide um, that shows um, 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 features of um, early autoimmune gastritis. Sorry. Just struggling to go back, sorry.
Okay. Okay, so this is a slide that shows early autoimmune gastritis. So if you look at, um, at this is all, it shows a diffuse reddent and um, a dematous um, mucosa without remarkable um, atrophic gastritis. Then in this next slide, it shows um, 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 in slide in, in picture A, it shows no atrophy, but there's mild atrophy uh, uh, in B, in slide B, there's mild atrophic changes. Then in slide C, there's moderate um, atrophic um, um, changes. I think you've accidentally muted again, Yonela. And your camera is off, but the camera, I guess, is not too critical. Okay. Sorry, Prof. I'm just, uh, I think, um, let me just, uh, 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 apologies. Two minutes, there's a, um, uh, it's, it get, it's getting stuck as I'm moving. Oh, okay. All right. Check the wrong presentation. I don't know why. This is not the one I wanted to share. Okay, it's fine. Let me just continue. No Did you send it to Karen? Yes, I have it. Okay. I don't know, Yonela, will it be easier for you if Karen um, shares and advances your slides for you if you're having a problem with your one? You're, you're muted, hey? Yonela, can you still hear us? Um, yes, I can hear, okay. Have I unmuted now? Can you hear me? Yes, now we can hear you. Okay. Do you want Karen to present? to present your stuff or are you happy to go ahead? Uh, can, can um, uh, okay, I think I can go ahead. Uh, maybe he, he, she can on that side. Thanks, Prof. All right, then you'll have to uh, stop sharing, eh? Okay. Yeah. All right. Okay, I'll start sharing from this side. Okay, dokie. Oh, I've got too many things open. Um, sorry, let me just close a few things. Okay. Um, in the meantime, um, can I just ask everybody who has their camera on, if it's okay to please put it off, that just helps with the uh, transmission. And then at the end, when you have questions or whatever, then uh, you can put your cameras back on. And also please mute um, your mics. Thanks. Sorry, I'm struggling on my side now. Okay. Okay, I've got it. Oh, sorry, I'm really struggling here as well. What, you can't get it up? No, it's opening up the previous PowerPoint that I had and not and not not the presentation. Um, 
I mean, I have hers, but the, the one I have is the one where I've got all sorts of red marks and suggestions. So it's not a, <laughs> it's not a presentation ready one. Oh, okay, let me try again, Prof. That's, okay. That's, okay. And Yonel, I don't know whether it's your arm or a sleeve or something. Um, okay. It keeps the um, muting sort of on its own. So maybe just clear the area where you're working or something is disturbing your work. Okay. Yeah. Okay, I think I was here, all right. Karen, maybe in the interim, can you send me the latest one? Then I can share if, if there are serious problems going forward. Sure. You can just email it, yeah. All right, Yonela is coming up. All right, let's cross fingers and hope for the best. Okay. okay. Um, can you see, Prof? I can't see yes, my sure. screen nicely, okay. It's a slide on a trove, yeah. We can see it clearly. We can see it clearly, okay. All right. Okay, so the, um, the characteristic um, endoscopic features of um, atrophic uh, gastritis include a pale appearing gastric mucosa, loss of uh, rugal folds, increased visibility of mucosal blood vessels due to thinning, of the gastric mucosa and um, frequently presence of vis visible um, atrophic um, border. So if we look at picture A, there's no atrophy and uh, picture B, there's mild um, um, atrophy with patchy atrophic change without transparent vessels. But when you look at C, there's moderate um, atrophy, transparent vessels on the antrum. And then D, the severe atrophy with transparent uh, vessels noted throughout the antrum and the corpus. So if we look at the gastrointestinal complications of um, uh, vitamin B12, um, we get, the we get uh, atrophic glossitis with the, with the smooth and beefy red tongue, uh, megaloblastosis of the epithelial, epithelial cells of the small intestines, which may result in diarrhea and malabsorption. Um, um, uh, increased um, risk for adenocarcinoma with the uh, intestinal uh, metaplasia. And there's also, there can also be echloridria and bacterial overgrowth, which may also lead to the formation of carcinogenic uh, nitroasamines. There's also an increased risk of gastric carcinoma plus gastric carcinoid um, tumors. And neurological complications um, can uh, range from peripheral neuropathy, subacute combined degeneration of the spinal cord with a mixture of um, um, posterior and lateral column lesions, and also some cerebral, cerebral um, 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 effects with mild personality def def defects, memory loss uh, with also frank psychosis, uh, termed as megaloblastic uh, madness. So in investigations, um, investigations, um, you'll start with a, a complete uh, blood count with uh, which will reveal microcytic anemia with a reduced uh, in absolute reticulocytosis. There can also be um, uh, what um, the smear will show oval macrocytes with also hypersegmented uh, neutrophils. Pencytopenia is seen only in about uh, five to thirty-seven percent of cases, and also in severe cases of pernicious, uh, pernicious anemia. Um, there's a presence that uh, uh, can present with pseudo thrombotic microangiopathy, which is hemolysis, thrombocytopenia, and schistocytes with the high uh, mean um, um, elevated um, uh, LDH levels, lactate uh, dehydrogenase levels. So the laboratory diagnosis um, of um, megaloblastic anemia is a uh, megaloblastic anemia with the um, MCV of more than uh, 100 with the low levels of B12, which is less than uh, 200, and gastric atrophy, um, which is um, the gold standard of uh, presentation, and then the, of diagnosis with the presence of antibodies to gastric parietal cell or intrinsic factor. It is important to note to differentiate between B12 and folate deficiency, as treatment of B12 with folate may reverse megaloblastic blood picture, but the neurological complication may worsen. 
and measurement of um, serum hollow trans I two, which is the transporter, you can measure that because it tends to fall before vitamin B12. The others that can support is an elevated methyl melanonic acid level, which is specific for vitamin B12. While a serum homocysteine is less specific because um, it can also be elevated in uh, folate deficiency. So this is a schematic diagram um, on the diagnosis of uh, pernicious anemia. So um, it just summarizes what I've just said. So um, uh, patients can have atrophic body gastritis with an increased fasting gastrin with reduced levels of pepsinogen or and uh, histological, which confirms also um, if you do biopsies, histological confirmation of the gastric, bi uh, bi gastric biopsy. And there also be reduced intrinsic um, factor and also um, uh, antibodies to parietal uh, cell anti um, antibodies. Um, as I've said, uh, reduce uh, vitamin B12 for the microcytic anemia. And then um, 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 as I've noted, you also, if those are um, low, you get neurological disorders and you can also uh, measure serum, methyl, melanic acid and homocysteine as well. So investigation, uh, type A chronic uh, atrophic gastritis, which is the immune one, can be confirmed by biopsy. Um, a total echloridria is a direct result of the um, loss of gastric parietal cells is um, diagnostic of pernicious anemia. So you can also um, uh, check the levels and hypergastrinemia spurring of the antrum and stimulation of gastrin producing gel cells by um, echloridria. So a low pepsinogen um, plus destruction of chief cells can also um, 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 support the diagnosis. Um, pernicious anemia um, is associated with other autoimmune um, um, diseases. Hashimoto's um, thyroiditis being the most common um, and um, um, insulin dependent diabetes mellitus and um, Addison's uh, disease, primary ovarian failure, primary hyperparathyroidism and Graves' disease and vitiligo. And then the others are myasthenia gravis and Lambert uh, Eaton um, syndrome. Um, um, sorry, Prof. Sorry, guys. Um, I'm, I'm just having difficulty. This is the not updated presentation that's sharing. Oh, it's fine. It's fine. It's fine. I can continue. Okay. Yeah, I can see that it's not updated, yeah. but it's fine. Okay. Yeah. I think maybe that's why I was uh, struggling, sorry. And then vitamin B12 can be administered uh, parenterally, um, intramuscular injections of uh, 1,000 micrograms every day um, uh, for the first week, then weekly for a month, followed by uh, monthly injections. Um, patients uh, do require lifelong treatment. Then to note what we had added here is that um, there are also um, oral preparations which are available for patients that are um, 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 have contraindications to um, IM injections. Um, so those, but you can't give um, oral, um, um, uh, oral um, treatment is not indicated for patients that have neurological um, dysfunction. So monitoring, um, there's increased in reticulocyte count uh, within three days of treatment. There's reduced levels of um, uh, methyl melanonic uh, acid in the, first five, in the first five days of treatment. And there's also sustained normalization of B12, which occurs following two weeks of therapy. So microcytosis correction takes place during the first month and surveillance is mandatory to detect early and long-term uh, consequences of, uh, um, um, of uh, um, um, uh, chronic um, 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 sorry, uh, chron um, chronic um, gastric atrophy. Um, so, and then uh, what I'd added here as well, in terms of, um, um, sorry, um, in terms of monitoring, um, so um, if uh, patients have autoimmune, um, um, autoimmune um, a type A uh, gastritis, the recommended, uh, the recommended um, um, monitoring is basically for patients uh, is, is about um, um, surveillance endoscopy every three to five years, you can um, um, check. And then if a patient, um, you are worried, there's also family history of gastric cancer, you can um, monitor every year to about um, every two years. So you can monitor those patients. So you don't always have to monitor in terms of everyone. If there is mild um, atrophy and it's not related to uh, autoimmune, it's type B, um, it's, they say you don't have to um, uh, monitor. 
And then when you're looking at um, iron deficiency, so iron deficiency is the most common nutritional disorder worldwide. It accounts for half um, of anemia cases. It affects 3% of adults and slightly more common in women uh, of, uh, which are less than 50 years. And it can result from inadequate intake, reduced iron absorption, increased iron demand and increased iron loss. Um, menstrual loss is common, a cause of iron deficiency in premenopausal women. In adults and men and post um, in adult men and postmenopausal women, often due to chronic blood loss from the gastrointestinal tract, iron deficiency may be the first presentation of colonic or also phago gastric carcinoma. And these are some of the um, uh, causes, uh, patholog uh, pathological uh, causes of iron deficiency anemia. Um, chronic blood loss. If we look at the digestive tract, GI tract, inflammatory bowel, for example, um, uh, peptic ulceration, inflammatory bowel disease, vascular uh, malformation, genitourinary tract, um, hematuria, um, gynecological bleeding, all causes, including uh, malignancy, malabsorption syndromes, um, iron chelation, enteropathies, including celiac disease and Crohn's and NSAID enteropathy small bowel surgery after resection or bypass, and then associated with anemia of chronic um, disease as well. So the initial clinical assessment of iron de uh, deficiency uh, requires a detailed history. This helps to ascertain the cause um, and initial investigations of confirmed uh, iron deficiency include um, an analysis of and urine microscopy and also um, to investigate for uh, gynecological causes depending on the history you're getting um, from the patient and also for screening of celiac disease as well as it said about um, this is more in Europe um, um, patients with uh, celiac disease um, three to five percent of them have um, iron deficiency can present with iron deficiency anemia and where appropriate, um, endoscopic examination of the upper and lower GI tract um, may be um, required. Men and postmenopausal women with newly diagnosed iron deficiency anemia can get a bidirectional uh, endoscopy as um, uh, first line of GI investigation. So diagnosis, uh, ferritin is the most sensitive and uh, most specific and cost-effective test to diagnose iron deficiency in the absence of inflammation. With the um, a ferritin of uh, less than 15 micrograms, um, it's consistent with iron deficiency, but the cutoff of 30 micrograms improves sensitivity from 25 to 92% and the specificity to about 98%. So a ferritin of more than 100 um, generally excludes um, uh, iron deficiency, but this is in patients who don't have any um, uh, inflammatory um, disease. Um, chronic inflammatory disease. And um, so if the ferritin and there's no uh, chronic disease is more than 100, then that generally does exclude iron deficiency. So if there is a evidence of anemia and anemia is defined uh, by the World Health Organization as a hemoglobin of less than 13 grams in men, um, 13 grams per deciliter in men and less than 12 in non-pregnant women. And these are all um, above uh, men and women above the age of 15 years and a hemoglobin of less than 11 grams per deciliter in pregnant women, then that's uh, anemia. So you need a diagnosis of um, a low um, a hemoglobin, a low ferritin, um, and then supporting would be a low um, um, trans um, um, afferent saturation and a low iron and an uh, elevated total iron binding capacity and an increased cell zinc protoporphyrin and also increased serum transferrin receptor with a reduced reticulocyte um, um, count. Up to 40% of patients with iron deficiency will have a normal um, cystic um, um, anemia. So when we're looking at iron deficiency versus um, uh, anemia of chronic disease, ferritin is an acute phase reactant as um, uh, discussed. Therefore in patients with chronic inflammation or infection, so a ferritin of less than 50 micrograms um, um, per liter is, uh, is uh, likely to be um, um, iron um, to diagnose iron deficiency. It can be difficult to differentiate iron deficiency anemia versus um, um, uh, anemia of chronic disease. So in heart failure, um, iron deficiency anemia is diagnosed with a ferritin of less than 100 micrograms per liter or um, a, a ferritin of less than 300 micrograms per liter with a, trans, um, a, a transferrin saturation of less than 20%. In uh, chronic disease, iron deficiency is diagnosed with a ferritin of less than 100 micrograms 
uh, per liter or um, a ferritin of less than 200 micrograms per liter plus a transfer, uh, transfer and saturation of less than 20%. And then um, the other um, a point I'd added here was that um, in uh, inflammatory bowel disease, um, a, ferritin, um, a ferritin of less than 20 micrograms and um, um, a percentage such, uh, set of less than 15% diagnosis iron deficiency anemia, um, especially um, if the patient has active disease as well, um, then um, you also, um, it does um, diagnose, I think, yeah, um, um, iron deficient anemia. So if there's no inflammation and ferritin level is indeterminate, so a ferritin of 31 to 99, then a low uh, iron level, a low transference saturation and a total um, high total iron binding capacity does um, um, diagnose um, um, iron deficiency. A, solo, a soluble transferrin receptor and um, um, bone marrow biopsy can be considered if the diagnosis remains unclear, but it's not um, really um, warranted. So if we look at um, celiac disease, um, celiac disease um, and um, iron deficiency, um, celiac disease is found in three to 5% cases of unexplained iron deficiency. And the seronegative um, celiac disease is high in, uh, in the elderly group. And in the elderly group, they're likely to present with malabsorption, including iron deficiency. And, um, and these patients, they require a bi-directional scope, scope, including um, a biopsy to exclude cel celiac disease. So imaging of um, the GI tract. So one needs to, um, depending on the, um, um, history and what uh, they get, especially as I've said in elderly patients, um, you you do you 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 have to examine the upper and lower GI tracts, and um, clinicians can do it at the same time. You don't have to bring the uh, patient uh, at another time; you can do it at the same time. CT colonography is an alternative to colonoscopy in certain situations, especially if they've got major comorbidities or the situations where you can't um, uh, do a colonoscopy. There's limited place for um, contrast CT, there's no role for contrast fluoroscopy in um, uh, iron deficiency anemia. So if we look at the entity of um, non-anemic iron deficiency, this is where the body stores are depleted, but hypoferritinemia, um, which is the low ferritin, but the hemoglobin is normal. And the um, overall prevalence of GI pathology in this, in this group is, um, is low. And then, um, um, for example, uh, malignancy of the GI is quite low. And GI investigation is not warranted in premenopausal women. And, um, but in, uh, there's a low th threshold for investigations in men and postmenopausal women. Um, and also if in those who have GI symptoms and also a family history of um, um, GI um, malignancy. So treatment, um, so if we look at treatment, um, a treatment that uh, different, um, for there's intravenous, there's oral. So in the, I'll come back to this table. So all treatment is started as soon as uh, diagnosis is confirmed by uh, lab investigation and, and treatment and investigation uh, normally proceed in parallel. So as you're starting the treatment, you're also investigating what is causing the iron de uh, deficiency. There is, um, and um, the treatment, you need to treat the underlying cause once you've di the diagnosis has been made. There's also a beneficial rise in the hemoglobin within two weeks of commencing um, oral um, IV uh, ion treatment, oral or IV uh, ion treatment. And therapy should be continued for months after um, anemia is corrected to allow iron stores to become uh, replenished. The problem with the oral treatment is uh, adherence. Um, adherence to oral iron can be a barrier to treatment with a GI adverse effects, epigastric discomfort, nausea, diarrhea, and constipation. And constipation. Um, medication, um, some of the interactions with medications with uh, proton pump inhibitors, gastric um, um, acid hyposecretion, and association uh, can all be associated with reduced absorption of um, dietary iron and iron tablets. 
So if we're looking at the um, um, IV or parenteral iron, um, it's the pre it's preferred in some instances where there's um, GI if, uh, side effects to uh, oral treatment, and also if there's worsening of symptoms of inflammatory bowel disease, uh, unresolved bleeding, renal failure, induced anemia, um, treated with erythropoietin, insufficient absorption in patients with celiac disease. So this is the preferred um, a method. Um, treatment. Okay, so if we're looking at the um, 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 IV treatments, the formulations, so there's um, um, sorry, there's um, dexarufram, which is a high molecular weight dextrin, which has been discontinued due to high incidence of anaphylaxis. And then there's also, um, um, it's not these, some of these are not shown in the slide. There's also Cosmophor, which is a low uh, molecular dextrin, which is still in use. It's effective and um, it has lower incidences of anaphylaxis. And there's also Ferric Derismo Maltose, which is Monofa, is an alternative to shorter infusion and because it also has a shorter infusion time. And then the other is um, Ion Sucrose, which is Venophor. Um, which is a slow in, um, injection um, given at 100 to 200 milligrams, two to three times a week, thereby avoiding um, 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 but the only disadvantage with Venafor is that you have to give it uh, over you know, a couple of um, uh, doses. So that could also be a, um, a disadvantage for, um, and then the others um, in terms of oral formulations, I'm just gonna go back to this. So there's, um, Ferric Maltol, which is or, um, as uh, the standard the, um, British Society of Gastroenterology recommends the ferrous uh, preparation, which is ferrous sulfate as the first line um, because it is cheap, it's got good bioavailability and it's available in multiple preparation and it's been shown to replenish stores and correct anemia. Um, but as mentioned, one of its limitations is the uh, frequency and severity of side effects, which is constipation, which is the most frequent, nausea and then diarrhea. And uh, with um, ferrous sulfate, the do dosing remains a contentious issue between clinicians because um, the previous um, most, uh, I think the dose that a lot of people knew was the uh, 200 milligrams, which is given, given in uh, three divided doses. But um, as recent studies have shown that even if you give a dose of 100 milligrams of um, ferrous sulfate, um, it, uh, that is um, adequate. And also because the dose of the elemental ion um, can, that can be absorbed is only about 10 to 20 milligrams uh, per day. And each tablet I think contains about 60 uh, milligrams of uh, elemental ion. And then the other um, treatment is um, ferric maltol, which is a novel preparation. Studies, as studies were limited to inflammatory bowel disease with sustained normal hemoglobin for up to 64 weeks. And then the other novel one is sucrosomial ion. Um, sucrosomal uh, ion has its unique structure, which protects it uh, from the acidic environment in the stomach, and it increases intestinal epithelial absorption and ensures high bioavailability. So it's more uh, it's got a, uh, uh, it's more efficacy. It increases the hemoglobin and ferritin more than ferrous sulfate, and it's non inferior also to IV ion. Just on the, um, um, before I move on, the other thing I wanted to mention, which was the association mechanism of uh, iron deficiency in H. pylori, is just that in the, uh, this presentation, it's not uh, showing because it's not up the, apologies, the updated presentation. So if you look at the mechanism uh, of iron deficiency in H. pylori, um, there has been association, which has, uh, and they've stipulated three mechanism that of blood loss um, from H. pylori, and uh, one is uh, decreased iron absorption, and the other is uh, H. pylori, uh, which uses the iron, and then the third one is hepcidin, which um, decreases release of iron from macrophages and um, enterocytes. So um, just to explain these, um, the first one is basically as ferric iron is absorbed, um, the acidic pH of the stomach, it is reduced by ascorbic acid to ferrous iron. So decreased level of uh, ascorbic acid and stomach acidity, secondary to inflammatory changes caused by H. pylori, cause inadequate ion absorption. And also gastritis can lead to um, 
oxidized um, to pre predominance of the oxidized um, biologically inactive form of the ascorbic acid in the gastric juice, this also re um, reduces the absorption of iron. But on the other hand, we know that bacteria need iron also for growth, which is the second mechanism. And um, sometimes um, the uh, bacteria also competes um, for the um, iron so of, with the host. So H. pylori, um, even when asymptomatic, the patient is asymptomatic, can reduce the iron absorbed from the diet by taking iron directly from the contents of the stomach. The bacteria can reduce the amount of available iron to the host. And then um, the third um, uh, mechanism um, that they did um, show was hepcidin, um, which is a, pept a peptide synthesized by the liver um, and uh, regulates absorption of um, um, available iron in the intestines. So um, H. pylori also um, um, plays a role in reducing this um, hepcidin. So in, ter in terms of follow-up, um, in terms of follow-up, there's no standard recommendations for follow-up after initiation of therapy uh, with iron. So um, what is recommended is to check the hemoglobin, um, is to check the hemoglobin. Um, and um, another approach is to check periodically, is to check the um, hemoglobin every three months for a year. Then the other approach is to recheck periodically and um, no further follow-up if the patient remains asymptomatic with the and the hematocrit remains normal. In terms of blood transfusion, um, blood transfusion is really required um, for treatment of iron deficiency anemia. Um, because if you uh, think about the anemia is slowly developing and um, patients um, do adapt to the res uh, resulting uh, stress and IV iron, um, normally patients will respond within a week to two weeks if you do give it to them. And um, blood transfusion is reserved for severe symptomatic or circulatory compromise. And um, it's only recommended, in, um, it's also recommended in pregnant women with the hemoglobin of less than six grams per deciliter, as this can also lead to abnormal fetal oxygenation. And uh, one unit of um, um, blood contains about 200 milligrams of elemental iron. Therefore, if you think about this, will not re replenish iron stores in severe iron deficiency anemia. So even if you do transfuse the patient, you still will need to um, um, top up with um, um, IV iron. Okay, thank you. I'm so sorry. I think this is the wrong presentation, but that's the end. That's all right. Thank you so much, Yonela. Okay, but Karen, sorry, Karen has the other presentation, the final one. Sorry about That's that. It's okay. I think you did well mm -hmm. considering that uh, you had technical mm -hmm. issues um, okay. and you couldn't load uh, some of the updated stuff. But I think you've covered most of it because look, mm -hmm. these two topics are, are quite uh, difficult because there's a lot of pathophysiology uh, going on. And I think um, uh, I think you did a good job of, of highlighting some of the main issues in each category. And the reason I put this topic up is because pernicious anemia is woefully, woefully underdiagnosed and underrecognized. And when patients uh, continue, sometimes for decades, uh, without a diagnosis, because uh, it's subtle, the anemia is subtle and the manifestations, they come on quite slowly. The patient must, may actually become used to living uh, with, with anemia and some neurological symptoms and even some early heart failure symptoms, et cetera, without realizing that they are anemic. And actually the clinicians, may not necessarily be diagnosed in this condition early. Uh, so patients can have um, symptoms uh, and anemia for two decades, three decades, without anybody actually making the diagnosis of pernicious anemia. And the association between cobalamin deficiency and iron deficiency, particularly when the problem is gastritis and inflammation of the corpus, um, uh, is quite high. And so when you have a patient with severe iron deficiency, and you think that the cause is probably due to uh, gastritis, whether it's due to H. pylori or autoimmune uh, disease. I think it's not a bad idea, particularly if there's macrocytosis, to also look um, for um, B12 uh, and then take it, uh, take it down. So what I'm gonna do, Yonela, if you don't mind, please go back to the beginning of your slides, ne? so that I can just pick up on some of the points. Uh, Noné, I see you've uh, made some comments. Uh, I'll come to those. Um, 
as we go along. And if anybody else has any questions or comments, uh, please uh, post them. Um, or at the end of my sort of review, then uh, you can uh, unmute yourself uh, and ask the question. So, I mean, in the simplest terms, if you think about what pernicious anemia is, it's a megaloblastic anemia due to B12 deficiency. And the cause is, is that it's an autoimmune disorder that affects uh, gastric cells and causes atrophy. So, so that's quite important. Um, and as I say, the association between it and folic acid deficiency and iron deficiency is, is higher than you might think. So you always need to keep that in mind. Um, okay, next slide, please, Ayonela. Yeah, so um, even though, the, so the, the prevalence is quite low in people under 60, um, something like 0.1%, something like that. But once you reach 60 and above, it goes as high as two to 3%. And actually the median age of presentation is anywhere between ages 70 and 80. And the other difference between, if you're trying to um, differentiate um, H. pylori associated gastritis from pernicious anemia due to autoimmune disorder is that with H. pylori, there may be differences um, in age, uh, in geographical placement. So some areas in Africa are much higher uh, affected than others. Childhood, you know, the rates of uh, H. pylori are much, much higher in childhood than they are in adults. So, so those are some of the differences if you're trying to decide whether a patient has got corporal predominant uh, gastritis due to H. pylori versus an autoimmune disease. Because as you know, H. pylori prefers the entra first. Of course, with treatment, it can migrate up to the corpus, uh, but typically it, different, it, it, it presents with enteral gastritis, whereas pernicious anemia is typically corporal uh, gastritis. And sometimes it's not that easy to differentiate the two. And in fact, sometimes the two may coexist. You may have a patient who's got uh, HP gastritis of the entrum and the corpus. Um, uh, and also um, in terms of, um, I think there was a place where, where you mentioned that um, pernicious anemia and H. pylori, the relationship is unclear. There is yeah. suggestion in animal studies that um, there's molecular mimicry between the proton pump and H. pylori. And so it may even be that in patients with pernicious anemia, the initiating effect was a molecular mimicry with the um, induction of the immune system against the proton pump because um, the immune system sensed um, H. pylori. Um, and in fact, some studies suggest that patients with autoimmune pernicious anemia actually do have H. pylori as well. So there could be a, a spectrum of patients who do have a pernicious anemia as a result of autoimmunity but there may be some H. pylori um, uh, present, which was the inciting uh, event for the um, autoimmune uh, response against the, the pump. Okay, next slide, please. That was fine, beautifully explained. Uh, that was fine. That is all good. As I say, the difference between entrum and corpus predominant, that was fine, thank you. So Yonela, if you, you I think you spoke about um, surveillance of patients with atrophy, because as you correctly say, patients who've got um, significant atrophy yeah. due to the chorea cycle are at high risk of developing metaplasia and then um, uh, adenocarcinoma of the stomach. Mm -hmm. So which patients will you screen? I think you said something about old age, maybe family history, you know, yeah. the severity of the atrophy and the location of the atrophy, but what um, objective scores or tools can you use to decide which patient needs to be uh, surveilled for the potential of developing gastric cancer? So there was also this, um, 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 what score was, <laughs> okay, there was the, I think it was the up, uh, updated Sydney. I'm not sure if I was using the right one. And okay, so that's a protocol. Okay, tell us about okay. the Sydney protocol in terms of, so, so, so. So what you're looking for is what is called, you've heard of Olga and Olgem. Mm -hmm. So Olga is the operational link mm. for gastric um, um, uh, infection assessment. And then the Olgem is the operational link for intestinal metaplasia of the gastric okay. assessment. Mm -hmm. And it is a score that you use to um, evaluate the severity and the extent of gastric atrophy in the stomach. Okay. And in order to decide that or to define that, then you use the Sydney protocol. Okay. Right. To take biopsies um, so that um, the patient can then be graded in terms of severity and the location 
uh, and the extent of the atrophy, which will then tell you uh, how high the risk is for that particular patient to go on to progress to cancer. So how do we biopsy uh, using the Sydney uh, protocol? So um, biopsying um, using the Sydney protocol, basically um, they, um, so I'd had a, um, a diagram on the other presentation um, where your biopsy should be on the lesser and the greater curvature of the antrum, which is within two centimeters of the um, pylorus and also in the incensura and also the lesser and the greater curvature of the corpus as well. Exactly, so at least five biopsies. Yeah. And what is specific about them? Are you gonna, how are you going to send those biopsies to the lab? What are you gonna make sure that the nurses understand? Or what will be your instructions? Mm, that they must um, separate them <laughs> properly. Yeah, so you must, must separate them. Yeah. Ideally, you must put them in separate bottles and you mm -hmm. must orientate the specimen ideally. Uh, mm -hmm. And if cost is an issue or whatever, then at least you can lump the corporal bi uh, biopsies and then the entral biopsies with the incisura together. Then it's two mm -hmm. sort of separate bottles. But ideally, you want incisura, entral, and corpus in three separate bottles, properly labeled, and then you send it off to the lab. Make sure the stomach is clean, no mm -hmm. residue, no bubbles, and fully distended. And then you assess, ideally using a high-definition uh, uh, white light, uh, and if you've got NBI or whatever, then you're looking for targeted lesions. Use it so that you can see for nets and nodules and irregular areas in, in addition to the biopsies uh, for, for, for Sydney. So you need Sydney biopsies and then targeted biopsy if you see anything abnormal and definitely biopsy the atrophic uh, uh, sites. So it's really, really specific. And um, if you are a pathologist and you get samples which are clumped together or they were not properly labeled, how would you decide from the pathological sample that this is probably from the entrum and this is probably from the corpus as a pathologist, if it wasn't labeled properly or it was- It wasn't labeled. Box, yeah. Mm. Didn't go into the details. So you can do that. special stains for gastrin, for instance. So if you do okay. special stains for gastrin, mm. then you will know that that's probably entrum. Okay. And if you do special stains for pep pepsinogen, et cetera, then at least you might have an idea that, okay, these biopsies came from the body of the stomach. Mm -hmm. But I think that is why it's important to make sure that you label them properly and you send them off uh, uh, properly. And then, yeah, I will send you guys a paper uh, mm -hmm. on this Olga staging and the Olgin staging, which is basically tools that you use to assess the severity and the extent and the degree of gastric atrophy to try and determine the risk of the patient uh, for gastric adenocarcinoma. And if you, for easy, to remember it easily, the risk is similar to the risk in Barrett's. It's about 0.1 to 0.3% per year. If you have severe gastric atrophy uh, with the requisite risk factors of developing a gastric cancer. So we don't, uh, we don't uh, surveil patients. Um, it's really individualized based on the patient, their risk factors, you know, smoking, comorbidities, family history, geographical area, if the patient comes from East Asia, West Asia, you might consider screening ways. If it's a South African person, you might not, but if it's a Caucasian person who also has autoimmunity and other things, you know, so it's, um, you have to consider that, but there's no strict guidelines as to who, you just have these tools to help you decide who might need um, um, surveillance. Okay, I was gonna talk about what you do if you find a polyp um, in association with gastric atrophy. But I think next week's talk is pre-malignant um, polyps of the stomach, et cetera, et cetera. So that can be covered in that talk, just uh, in the interest of time. But the, you know, the, you know, whether you do polyp polypectomy or EUS, the size that you do it for, et cetera, et cetera. So that will be covered next week. All right, let's go on. Yeah, that's fine. It's nicely covered. And really the important thing is to remember to always test for H. pylori to look for folic acid deficiency, and obviously in the right clinical test uh, uh, setting to do the B12 and then intrinsic factor and the parietal cell antibodies. Um, okay, what causes the neurological complications uh, in, in patients with pernicious anemia? What compounds or what specifically actually cause the neurological uh, presentation? Not that, obviously anemia can because you need Globin for enzymes and for, 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 for that sort of thing, but um, 
So it's the homocysteine and the oh. MMA. They did, um, they um, damage like acid. myelin. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So they, they damage myelin and, and that's what really causes the that's what causes the, the neurological uh, presentations. And so patients may come with urinary incontinence if they've got subacute uh, combined or, or all sorts of other things. And, 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 and really, if you haven't picked this up over decades and decades, patients can actually die from heart failure and neurological complications. All right, next slide. Yeah, that's fine. That's all good. Yeah, I think uh, keep going. Yeah, yeah, that's okay. Yeah, and I think you did say that uh, if uh, the patient has got neurological um, symptoms, then definitely no oral therapy. And then there are newer uh, sublingual and intranasal preparations. But in our setting, you know, IV uh, is best. Patients feel amazing within two weeks of therapy, but you need to monitor the patient. And of course, if you've diagnosed pernicious anemia, it's lifelong therapy. If you're diagnosing pernicious anemia for the first time uh, from blood tests or neurological symptoms, the patient must have a gastroscopy. One, to look for um, atrophy and also to look for neuroendocrine tumors and other complications. So at least we must have a screening colonoscopy if you are making the diagnosis of pernicious anemia for the very, very first time. And then a screening is a different story. As I said, we can discuss that uh, next week, uh, how you do so. All right, so iron deficiency, we've talked about this ad nauseum. There are lots of talks on the Gastro uh, Foundation website, both from our end and also from the uh, GECO, um, uh, patient blood management group. Professor Vernon Lowe has talked about, you know, how it's absorbed, et cetera, et cetera. I think you guys have heard a lot about that. The reason we bring it here is really, really in the context of how you make a diagnosis when there is inflammation on board. And for us, particularly H. pylori. Um, so Yonela will uh, upload the, the updated presentation that has got uh, the mechanism of uh, iron deficiency anemia in H. pylori, because H. pylori in our setting is hyperendemic, you need to know that. And then also in um, inflammatory bowel disease. That the, all the diagnostic, uh, the, 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 the bodies suggest uh, intravenous um, uh, replenishment for inpatients with IDA uh, who've got IBD. Oral won't work. It upregulates, the inflammation upregulates hepcidin, which blocks absorption of iron. So you're wasting your time. If it's Crohn's, the mucosa is inflamed. It's not going to absorb uh, the iron anyway. So IV is the way to go. It's, it's uh, been uh, shown um, to show good outcomes. Patients uh, do better, better um, um, BDT, uh, et cetera. So that was the one thing that we wanted to stress. And I think Yonela did that very well. Um, yeah, I think with iron, and then just to be aware of the newer oral preparations um, that she has mentioned, uh, it will also be in the article that I'll send you. And then in terms of the IV preparations, um, the, more, the current uh, preparations that we use in terms of anaphylactic reactions are far, far less induced than the earlier preparations. It's not really necessary to calculate deficiency using the Galzoni formula. Generally for most patients, a thousand uh, milligrams of uh, iron uh, is sufficient, although I saw not that long ago, there's a paper that suggests that uh, 1,300 to 1,500 is probably more ideal uh, than the 1,000 that we give. But you don't have to calculate it now. You can give a, a, a 1,000 and then monitor the indices after about four weeks and then see if the patient needs a, a, a additional a, a replacement. All right, just go forward. I think that's, those are all the points that I wanted to make. Okay. Um, sorry, the other role um, which we had asked was um, the role of CRP, C-reactive protein, um, sorry, um, C-reactive protein. So they did say that uh, it may be appropriate in some cases, if you know, just to rule out unsuspected um, inflammation to measure the CRP um, in um, some patients. Yes, yeah, and in, ID, in, in IBD, then fecal cult protection, as well as your other features uh, of a flare or whatever will tell you um, whether a patient is iron deficiency, uh, iron, iron deficient or not. None, uh, she did say this uh, metformin um, can compete with uh, B12. So that can be a reason why somebody is uh, B12 deficient. And then you talk here about uh, GI investigations, particularly small bowel investigations in patients with occult um, GI blood. Uh, and these are the ones that typically present with uh, iron deficiency anemia. Um, and then Nona asked, what is the current recommendation for gastric cancer screening in pernicious anemia in South Africa? 
So in my view, no, no, we don't have any uh, national guidelines. I think each center or in fact, every gastroenterologist uh, individualizes uh, patients based, uh, based on individual risk assessment of the patient. And I think people do use the degree and extent of gastric atrophy uh, endoscopically as well as confirmed by uh, histology. If there is intestinal metaplasia, so that's the other thing I wanted to say. You can have gastric atrophy with or without intestinal metaplasia. That still is gastric atrophy. But if there is intestinal metaplasia, that patient has got extensive gastric atrophy. And these are the patients that should be followed up. So it's, um, um, so yeah, it's individually based, uh, based on individual risk and, and risk assessment. Um, Zamo says, thanks, regarding oral iron, it's stimulating hepcidin and thus it's subsequent absorption once a daily. Therefore, once daily or alternative daily dosing. Um, Zamo, maybe you can unmute. I'm not sure if you're making a comment or asking a question. Hi, <clears throat> hi, thanks, Prof. Um, I was actually uh, commenting um, on the on the oral, uh, particularly the ferrous sulfate, ferrous gluconate formulations. Yeah. I believe that they do indeed um, stimulate hepcidin. So many of the recommendation is for either uh, dosing once um, per day instead of that TDS, which has previous, I, I believe, some cases, uh, as well as then not dosing every day and skipping a day in between doses. Absolutely, 100% especially in inflammatory situations that you really once a day or even alternate day dosing. So it's, it's a far cry from what we used to do, which was 200 milligrams TDS. And as you rightly say, Yonela, you only need about less than 160 to 100 elemental iron. And even that, only 10% of that is absorbed. So loading the patient with iron not only can cause gastritis, by the way, and the side effects, but exactly what uh, Nzamo was also saying. Um, yeah, and Mzamo does talk about the OGA in the old gym. And then Sianda says, in which patients would you recommend homocysteine and MMA testing in addition to B12? Any idea, Yonela? Um, so um, I've, uh, what I read is, which wasn't really that clear, but it was in those patients where you do have um, um, on smear, it looks like they've got oval uh, microcytes, but the B12 is on the normal, it's, it's normal. Then you do um, check for um, homocysteine and uh, methyl malonic uh, acid. Yeah, 100%. So Sianda, you use it only if your clinical picture, either the patient's presentation or your endoscopic findings suggest that the patient has got a, a pernicious anemia, uh, but, and even maybe your, your uh, antibodies are positive, but you actually have a normal, uh, B12, uh, which could be falsely normal. Um, um, and some patients can still have uh, pernicious anemia with a normal uh, B12. So in that case, if you want to um, confirm the diagnosis, uh, then you will do homocysteine and MMA uh, levels. Um, so yeah, it, it's used in, in, in patients in whom your, your usual uh, diagnostic uh, tools uh, do not uh, align uh, and the picture is not clear, but based on your clinical suspicion, uh, in the presentation, they seem to, to present like patients with uh, pernicious anemia. They may even have other autoimmune disorders like thyroid disease and so forth. Uh, whether you should test every patient you diagnose with pernicious anemia uh, for a thyroid disease uh, is unclear. Um, but you know, the, uh, about up to 30% of patients with pernicious anemia have thyroiditis. So a third is, is quite a lot. And uh, maybe a, a screening TSH, um, I think, is not um, is not unreasonable. I don't I don't think. And then if you find abnormalities, then you can do thyroid uh, antibodies, etc. So, is there anybody else that has any other questions or comments or anything they'd like to highlight? We are uh, about six minutes over. Yeah, hello, Prof. I was just asking that. Uh... H. pylori of the antrum, can that cause gastric atrophy? Because my thought and my understanding is that uh, the one that affects the antrum commonly will cause uh, hypergastrinemia with ulcers, and then the one that affects the corpus uh, would be the one that will cause a gastric atrophy with risk for gastric CA. No, agreed. But you can have uh, uh, patients who do have copal predominant H. pylori. But yeah, if it's just antrum, you are really not likely to get uh, gastric atrophy. Except though, if the mechanism is that you had enteral H. pylori 
right? You're treating mm. it with the PPI. And then the medication fails or the patient didn't take medication or whatever. So H. pylori persists. But now it migrates up the corpus. Mm. Okay. So that on the basis of a, a gastritis based on H. pylori infection, mm. if that persists and the patient is untreated, yes, you could get uh, gastritis and ultimately you could get atrophy if it's untreated or unmanaged. Okay. okay. Yeah. Uh, Joseph? Hello. Hi, thanks, bro. Um, I just want to find out, so should you still treat this patient's uh, with um, um, B12 injections uh, lifelong, um, even if they have correctable causes, like if they had been on metformin, for example? No, so I think uh, lifelong is for patients in whom this is an autoimmune-mediated uh, gastritis. So if if it's a if it's a like you say if it's a drug or some antacid or something else and you treat that and that is resolved, then what you need to do is just to replenish the stores and then monitor uh, that the stores are replenished. And if the patient doesn't have neurological symptoms, then you can monitor once a year symptoms as well as blood. But if you are dealing with a patient who's got pernicious anemia, then the therapy is lifelong after re uh, replenishment. Okay, thank you. The other question, I don't know if she mentioned it and I'm, I might have missed it. There are some um, um, multivitamins that actually have cobalamin in them and which you take them orally. Um, what, what's, what's the thoughts on, on, on those? Thank you. In, for normal individuals? Um, to, use, to use those with um, uh, B12 deficiency? B12 deficiency. Look, I guess it would depend on what the daily recommended uh, average is of those uh, multivitamins. If it's in the range of a thousand micrograms per day, that might be sufficient depending on the degree of the B12 deficiency. But it may not in somebody who's got a, a long standing anemia which was undiagnosed and they are quite, quite deficient. Um, so, personally, I would say I would rather. A patient actually just has a B12, which is not mixed with any other vitamins that may potentially um, interact. For instance, a, a high vitamin C, which some of those multivitamins have, will cause a falsely low uh, B12. So really, you're not sure where you are, right? So I think uh, in a case where you've diagnosed deficiency, you would rather treat the patient with a B12 uh, containing um, uh, um, a substance uh, that is not clouded by other um, um, minerals uh, and uh, nutrients that, that may affect your biological picture, your bi biochemical picture when you're testing for response. Yes, Prof. And also I'm thinking in the context of someone who's already who already has um, pernicious anemia with um, antibodies to to parietal cells and intrinsic factors in terms of absorptions, even if you take them orally, I'm not sure if it's more or less the same thing compared to oral um, uh, ingested um, um, B12 from diet. Yeah, yeah. I, I would gather that uh, the absorption would be impaired. Um, so, and I'm not sure the side effects of oral B12. Did you come across that, Yonela? No, no, I didn't. Mm, I'm not sure about the side effects. Um, does anybody know about the side effects of oral ingested uh, B12 over time? And also for oral, uh, Joseph, you need between 1,000 to 2,000 micrograms per day. That's quite a big dose. Yeah, I, I don't know about thank that. You. Thank, you. Thank, thank you, thank you, Prof. I wouldn't think that the RDA from the, a multivitamin preparation would be sufficient to replete the stores completely. Nona, do you have any idea? Oh, hi, everyone, and thank you. I was writing something here already that pernicious anemia implies this intrinsic factor deficiency, and therefore oral vitamin B12 should not work. Yeah. Strictly speaking. Yeah. Otherwise, strictly. then other people can just eat meat and nice things. <laughs> Watch out for vegans. Watch out for vegans. Yeah, but yeah, that's true. We, yeah, watch out for vegans. Yeah, they don't get enough. They don't get yeah, enough. Otherwise, yeah. yeah. Thank you very much, Prof. All right, Yonela, well done. I think Thank being four months in is quite a lot. <laughs> I think you did very well.
Um, and I, as I said, I think this is a really important topic and it's generally missed even on the internal medicine award rounds because it is so insidious. And as I say, patients get used to this degree of slowly creeping up anemia. They really don't complain until they're really, really quite uh, ill, uh, especially uh, as a result of their neurology or even cardiac, maybe even liver disease uh, from uh, chronic um, heart failure. Anyway, thank you so much, Yonela. Really, really appreciate it. Um, thank you so much, Prof. Uh, if, if, if please send Karen the updated one, if, if yeah, she she's got it, she's got it. Okay, so that's I the one that it. yeah. Okay, so that's the one that will be uploaded on the on the okay. guest foundation website, and then I will up I will send the Karen two articles. The one is the uh, iron deficiency one, and then the other one is the um, is sort of a, a more comprehensive uh, article on on how you really manage patients with pernicious anemia, how you screen, what you do, etc. And uh, those. Uh, screening uh, scores uh, that uh, we've been talking about. Um, there is a um, feedback form uh, in, the, in the chat box, please uh, feel free to fill it. But of course you can contact me directly or, or Karen if you have any issues. We will have a session maybe at the end of the year where we can review what we've been doing for the year, what works, what doesn't work. It'll be halfway in our curriculum, but uh, maybe we can take some pointers uh, going uh, into next year to the second half of the, of the curriculum. So we will do that. We'll send you the dates for that. As you know, recordings are on the website. Uh, I heard a complaint that uh, the recordings from the Spear quote unquote uh, fellows meeting were not on the website. I have taken it up with Bini. So hopefully she's going to address that so that all the talks um, that happened over that weekend uh, will also be uh, uploaded uh, on the website. Uh, please give it a bit of time, maybe a week or so, but in about 10 days, two weeks, if uh, you don't see it, uh, somebody please do let me know so that I can follow up on that. All right, so next week, as I said, we're doing pre-malignant conditions of the stomach, so polyps and gastric cancer, and our presenter is Dale Peterson. On the other side of the Lisbeck River, the wrong side, uh, I'm looking forward to that. Um, I think we've done a lot of talking this evening. Uh, I really appreciate that you do attend um, these sessions. It's not uh, most convenient necessarily if you have families and you're preparing dinner, but uh, I do appreciate that you join. And we'll see you in a fortnight. Thank you so much, everyone. And Bye, cheers. Thank you. Bye. Bye, bro. Bye. Thank you, Karen. Bro. Bye. Thanks. Bye bye. Bye, bro. Thank you. Bye. So, what is this now? No, no, it's an old hand, eh? Huh? <laughs> is that an ancient hand? <laughs> <Hey>. <laughs> Take it down. <laughs> All right. Good night. Everybody. Thank you so much. Bye -bye. Good night. Bye -bye. Thank you, Prof. Sorry, I think I shared the wrong presentation. I'm so stressed. <laughs> Don't worry about it. I think most of the most of the stuff was on there anyway. And a lot of stuff yeah. you actually remembered. You mentioned it yeah. in the slide. So that's fine. Don't worry. Yeah. All right. Okay. Thanks, Prof, for the help. Bye, Dave. Yes, All right. Bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye.